Hello lovelies and welcome to a B2 whistle stop revision video. So what we are going to do today is just like last time we are going to look at all the topics that might come up. I've got some lovely pictures here which might help us that we're going to look at and we have got some past paper questions for you to play along with except this time a little bit more excitingly they are going to be appearing on your screen and you have to pause the video to do them. You can do the whole paper if you want to play along, that's great. But as I say, um, it will be coming up on the screen as well. So what topics do we need to know about? They're all interlinked, so I'm going to sort of skip about a bit, but that's going to be fine. So the first one we're looking at is homeostasis. Homeostasis, homo or homeo means the same, and stasis still so it's about keeping things the same okay um, and you need to know about three different things for this you need to know about keeping your blood sugar levels the same keeping your temperature the same and keeping your water the same so how do we do this well for our glucose we have got two hormones both made by the pancreas um, and you need to know these for higher you need to know that it is insulin that tells your body, hey, we've had quite a bit of sugar, let's store it. And it is glucagon that says, oh, we don't have a lot of sugar, let's get it out. So these are released by the pancreas as an endocrine organ into the bloodstream. The pancreas we've looked at as an exocrine organ making digestive um, enzymes last time, but we don't have to worry about enzymes at the moment we've done that uh, so we are now worried about the internal the endocrine system we also need to know a little bit about diabetes two types of diabetes type 1 and type 2 really imaginatively named there type 1 diabetes is usually you're born with it or it develops from a really young age um, you can get this as a complication from other medical issues. I do, do know someone who that's happened to. But type 1 diabetes is usually the childhood diabetes and it's just there. Your pancreas isn't working, it's usually a genetic issue. Type 2 diabetes, on the other hand, I should do it in this hand, on the other hand. Um, so type 2 diabetes is quite often, but not always, diet induced. And your pancreas is like, oh, you're making too much sugar. You know what? I give up. I can't just make insulin anymore. And that's when you have to start taking insulin externally and monitoring your blood sugars from that point of view. You don't have to worry about the islet cells that make it and how they are damaged. Um, the other things you need to know about temperature. So body regulation by temperature. Again, it's back to enzymes. Our enzymes all like to be at the same temperature, so our body runs at that temperature. It can raise up when we've got a fever to try and kill off any bacteria or viruses that are causing an illness, but viruses aren't alive, so you'd have to kill off your cells that are making the virus. But it also denatures our enzymes, which is why prolonged fevers, not a very good idea. Um, so what do we do to cool down when we're too hot? Say it's a nice sunny day. What we need to do is sweat, basically. And what sweating does is it releases water and that water can then evaporate off and that process of evaporating cools us down. So we're releasing sweat to cool down from evaporation. Uh, we also radiate out heat as well, don't forget. Another way of controlling heat is ear size, and we often look at that when we look at variation in different species and um, different types of adaptations. As I say, it's all linked in together. And ear size, the bigger the ear, the more heat you're going to loss, lose. This lovely thin part of the ear here, you've got so much heat loss through there. So if you've got a large um, ear like an African elephant or a fennec fox or a desert hare, all ones you're supposed to know about. Big ears lose lots of heat. Fantastic. Tiny ears like the Arctic fox um, or the like the snow hares, the Arctic hares. Small ears, very little heat loss because they want to keep their heat in. 
How do humans keep their heat in? Obviously we can wear jumpers, but that's kind of unique to us. So you can shiver. When you start to shiver, your muscles are moving and you're doing respiration and that respiration releases lots of energy. It releases it as heat. It's why you get warm when you exercise. So when you're shivering, you're using energy to heat yourself up. Um, also, when you're cold, if you look at your arm, all these little hairs on your arm are sort of standing on end. Uh, what they're trying to do is to trap a warm layer of air around you. Now, this works really well if you're a nice, big, furry polar bear or brown bear, or even if you're a little bird with lots of feathers and all floofed up doesn't work so well with humans because we just don't have the body hair that our close relatives, um, the apes, do. So, and again, we're going to come on to classification and different species in a bit. So yeah, temperature, we need to regulate that. And water. So obviously if we're hot and we're sweating, we then need to drink more to get water in. We also urinate to get water out. It's really important we have water in our digestive system as well to help everything move. And although that water is absorbed in the large intestine, you don't want things too dry because it's going to be hard to pass through. So you need to keep drinking water. Right, next thing we need to look at, and that is in this book, and that is the spinal cord. Okay, so this is possibly one of my favourite textbooks. Uh, I used this when I was doing A-level and bought this way, way back. Uh, and one of the reasons it's my favourite, not just because it's got all these gorgeous diagrams and it's so well explained, but also it was pu originally published by Mills and Boone. Uh, for those of you confused, that's the people who published all of the kind of cheap romance novels. Uh, back in the day so anyway we now have our spinal cord and we can see a receptor neuron so we've got a stimulus which affects the receptor neuron it then has to go to a coordination center in humans we've got our brain and our spine as coordination centers if it goes to the brain we have to think about it if it goes to the spine we don't so we've got our receptor neuron going up to our coordinator neuron. The coordinator neuron makes something happen straight away. It's called a reflex action. And then it sends out a message to the effector neuron. And so that has an effect. Our muscle will change. You put your finger onto a hot frying pan or something, straight away it goes through the spine and says, get that finger out of there and you lift it up. It's a reaction. It's a reflex. It's not something that you can control. Those of you who've been looking at um, child development and things like that will know we've got loads of reflexes, some of which we lose later on in life, uh, like the grab reflex and things like that. We've got some as babies that we lose, ones where we are in pain and we back away from the pain immediately. We don't lose those. Um, the other thing you need to know about is the reaction time, which is one of the required practicals. So you might do something like test your reactions, catching a ruler, take some drugs, for example, caffeine in the form of Coca-Cola, and see how that affects your reaction time. Obviously, we are limited with what sort of drugs we can give you in a school setting. So what I'd like you to do now is you're going to pause the video. And you're going to have a go at question two. This is the only one I've not got on the screen and I'm not going to talk you through. But this is gorgeous, all about this reflex arc and all about the required practical. So pause the video, go do it. Go. OK, so now you've done question two. And if you haven't, go back and do it. But now you've done question two, let's look at some of our hormones and how they affect us. So pituitary gland this one's really important because it produces a lot of the hormones and if it's not producing the hormone it's telling another part of the body to produce the hormone so the um we're going to look at some of the ones it does in a minute 
You also need to know about thyroxine, which is made in the thyroid glands in the neck. Uh, these are really important for you guys at the moment, because if this isn't working properly, you are going to have all sorts of delays and your brain isn't going to work. You're not going to grow properly, all of that sort of stuff. So your thyroid glands, so important. I mean, as an adult, yes, it's still doing stuff. But for you guys, it's controlling how you grow and how you learn and all sorts of stuff like that. The um, adrenal glands as well. Now, the adrenal glands are sat at your back on top of your kidneys and these produce, unsurprisingly, adrenaline. And adrenaline then goes on to affect the heart and speed it up. It's your fight and flight response. It's all that sort of stuff. You also need to know reproductive hormones. Uh, some of which are made, well, testosterone is made partly by the testes, partly uh, in response to a pituitary, and you're, you don't need to worry about that. But you do need to know about oestrogen and progesterone, which are made by the ovaries, and they also respond to luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone made by the pituitary gland, which is just in the back of your brain there. So, again, we're going to look at some diagrams. OK, so let's start off with follicle stimulating hormone. It's made in the pituitary and the follicle stimulating hormone goes to the ovary and it stimulates a follicle to be made. This follicle is going to be our little eggy in a minute. And this follicle releases oestrogen. OK, and if we look down here, we're at the start of our menstrual cycle. We've got very low. We've just lost all of our blood in our period and we've got follicle stimulating hormone making our follicle that then falls as our estrogen starts to rise our estrogen tells our pituitary that we are making a follicle and so the pituitary sends out luteinizing hormone and luteinizing hormone you've got a big spike on day 14 or Basically, it's 10 to 16 days usually before you are going to menstru menstruate again. Yeah. So it happens when you get this big spike when your egg is released. And obviously, it's not going to be day 14 for everyone because not everyone has a 28 day cycle. But in the exam, you do. So anyway, once you've ovulated, that luteinizing hormone drops and progesterone starts to be made and again that is made from the ovary and you've got a corpus luteum just there which is the scar tissue from where the egg has basically been exploded out of the ovary you can't get in or out of an ovary easily this is a defense mechanism if sperm got in there while the eggs were developing you would end up with about fifty thousand babies and you do not want that i mean I'll, I'll go into a little bit more about that in a bit. But um, so you've got your, oh, sorry, that's gone a bit, your corpus luteum, this scar tissue, which starts to say, you know what, let's make progesterone. If you are pregnant, your progesterone levels continue on. If you are not pregnant, you can see your progesterone levels falling as the size of the lining of the uterus falls so as the progesterone falls you start to have a period um you also need to know about contraception so when you don't want to have a baby you can take there's two types of pills there's the progesterone only pill or mini pill and that basically just keeps your body in this bit here so you aren't making any eggs because you've got the progesterone the whole time you can also take the combined pill which is estrogen and progesterone and again that um, stops the eggs from being starting to be made because it's stopping the follicle stimulating hormone so you're getting no eggs nothing released but your body is still cycling around these are hormonal contraceptives you also need to know about barrier method which are things like condoms, diaphragm. These are great at stopping STDs, although it's worth noting that no contraceptive is 100% efficient. You will still have some chance, even when used perfectly, of them failing. 
If, however, you want to have children and can't, we are going to, we then look at doing something like IVF and you need to take lots of hormones for that. It's particularly luteinizing hormone, which helps you ovulate. So you'll have luteinizing hormone and progesterone. Um, so you, you take follicle stimulating hormone. It will stimulate more than one follicle. And then when the doctors see that you've got lots of follicles stimulated or after a given amount of time, you then take luteinizing hormone, which then makes the ovaries release the eggs. It's why when you do IVF, you often then take quite a few eggs and then you can put multiple eggs back in. OK, so we're now going to look at a question. Are you ready? So here we go. We've got a hormone and we've got glands which release them. I want you to pause the video and write down the answers. I said pause the video and write down the answers. Do it. Have you written down the answers? If not, there's really no excuse. Go do it. But if you have, let's look at the answers. So luteinizing hormone we've said made in the pituitary gland and it targets the ovaries adrenal gland what's that going to do it's going to do adrenaline which targets our heart to make it faster it also targets our lungs and liver you only need one of those though and finally glucagon which we've already said is a pancreatic one and that targets the liver and the muscles so that they release the sugar. OK. OK, next bit to look at is reproduction. Reproduction. If you haven't seen Grease 2, the reproduction song, watch it after this video. It's amazing. Uh, it asks all the important questions like where does the pollen go? So you need to know about reproduction. It can be sexual or it can be asexual. There's lots and lots of binaries in GCSE biology paper two. So sexual reproduction is the one that you are possibly more familiar with, with the theory of it at any rate. And that is where the male gamete meets the female gamete and they combine and you get a new unique individual. Female gametes are always called eggs. Male gametes, if it's animal male gamete, it's a sperm. If it is a plant male gamete, it is called pollen. So pollen is basically plant sperm. So those of you with hay fever, you're allergic to plant sperm. Aren't you so much happier now that you know that? So sexual reproduction happens with something called meiosis. And meiosis is when your cells split in four. Okay, asexual reproduction, you've got your cells splitting in two with mitosis and you make clones and this is really good. Strawberry plants sending runners and you get clones of the adult, you know exactly what you're getting. Downside is there's no genetic variation and this variation, this underpins all of this topic. Okay, all of B2, it's all about variation pretty much. So... Yeah, asexual reproduction, no variation, clones, mitosis. Meiosis, though, is how we make gametes. And this is really important. So you start off with a somatic cell and somatic cells have two copies of every gene, two alleles. So two copies of every chromosome. And they start off and they divide normally. So you double up all your chromosomes they find their partner chromosome and then they are pulled apart by spindles and divide. Great, you've now got two cells. But then immediately, without doubling again, those cells find their partner chromosome, but not identical ones, just chromosome two with chromosome two. It's not an identical one. And they find each other, they line up and then the spindles pull them apart again. And now you've got a gamete because you only have half the genetic material. When it meets another gamete, it gets the other half, it's completed, you've got a somatic cell and you've got new life. 
and this causes all the variation and the beautiful differences that we have um so yeah meiosis cells splitting into four and that's how you make gametes or sex cells and we are going to have a go at another question it's question 4.1 if you want to locate it on your paper so here we go in sexual reproduction cells divide by meiosis to form gametes which two statements are true for cell division by meiosis pause the video and pick the answers pause it pause it pause it pause it do the question come on do the question okay so hopefully you have read through them and realized that we have got four daughter cells and we have also got a parent cell which divides twice as we've already stated the daughter cells only have one set of chromosomes they are are genetically different which is why we've got variation and the dna has only replicated once okay so what we're going to do now is we are going to think about um dna and what that does so dna is the four letters a and t c and g remember the straight ones a and t go together so you've got a t straight letters then you've got the curly ones you've got the c and you've got the g and sorry c and g let's do it the right way around for you and those ones go together so straight ones go together curlies go together um and these four letters create a code which makes all of our amino acids which then well which tells us which order to join our all of our amino acids together in and then they make the proteins and then that makes us so dna is really important the chromosomes that you should know about are the x and y chromosomes two x chromosomes and your body will develop female two so an x and a y chromosome and your body will develop male usually it's all about the stri gene on the y chromosome in practice so with our dna obviously we've got the letters that match up with the adenosine thymine and the cytosine and guanine all joining up together so we need to know that dna makes genes and a copy of a gene is called an allele all of these genes sit on chromosomes there's lots and lots of junk dna in there as well there's telomeres and centromeres which are coded differently very little of our dna is actually genes the rest of it does stuff and we don't fully understand what it does we just know that we need it there we understand what quite a lot of it does but not all of it we've got junk dna which does stuff but we can't actually see what it's doing it's like dark matter and stuff in space but anyway i'm not going to go into that too much so as i say you needed to know about xx female xy male um usually obviously there are loads of exceptions to this you can have xy females xx males it depends if you've got a stri gene or not you can have xxx xo xyy xxy loads of different types of sex chromosomes and they all do different things but we always teach xx uh, for female xy for male you also need to know about genetic diseases inherited diseases and the two you need to know about for this paper cystic fibrosis cystic fibrosis which is recessive which means it can be hidden and polydactyly which is dominant which means if the gene's there it's always there and we can liken this to eye colors so for example my eye color is brown now i happen to know that brown is dominant to blue and there are two ways i know this one is because i'm heterozygous it means i have two copies two different alleles i have a brown eye and a blue eye allele and my brown eye masks my blue eye allele it's go away i'm here we don't want to see you and the reason i know i'm heterozygous with a blue eye allele which is hidden is because my dad happens to be homozygous he has got 
two blue eye alleles and so I must have inherited one of those from him and that's the gene I passed on to my sons who have blue eyes as well. Obviously if you don't have a blue-eyed parent you won't know necessarily if you've got a blue-eyed gene because you haven't had babies yet but you never know you might find out in the future so what we're going to do now is we are going to look at a cystic fibrosis question it's question five three if you want to do it on the paper so here's the question we've got a man and a woman who do not have cystic fibrosis okay that is bolded so that means that word not is important information. The man and the woman have a child who has cystic fibrosis. Draw a Punnett square, what a nice easy question, to find the probability that their next child will have cystic fibrosis. Use these symbols and draw a ring around the genotype of any children with cystic fibrosis. To be honest, I see Punnett square and I'm going to do that straight away. So. Here we go. This is what the answer looks like. Here's our Punnett square. We've got our man and our woman uh, with M and W. And we can see they are both heterozygous because they both have different alleles. So you've got capital T and small t. OK. And we've got the same for the man as well. That gets your mark. You've shown them both as heterozygous. You then need to fill in the Punnett square correctly for the next mark. And to fill in a Punnett square, you just match up the letters. So we've got a big T here, big T here, big T here, big T there. And again with this one, big T and small t, and they join together. Now, we usually write it with the dominant allele first. It doesn't matter if you do it the other way around. So there you go. That's two marks. We then have to, it says, draw a ring around the genotype. So it's going to be recessive. It's going to be this one. And then the last one, it says we need to find the probability. So as we can see, one child out of four is going to have cystic fibrosis. Oh, there's a, yeah, one child out of four, we would normally say has cystic fibrosis, but every single child has that chance, has that 25% chance. And you can write this in four different ways. You could write it as one in four chance. You could write it as a one to three ratio. You could do it as 0 0.25 or 25%. So all of those would be acceptable. But do remember to draw a ring around it so that we know that you know which is the affected genotype. The only, well, if it's a dominant gene and the man and the woman don't have it, but the child does, it's because of a random mutation, not because they've been cheating necessarily. Uh, but with normally, if you don't have it and your child does, it's because it's a recessive gene. All right. So now we are going to look at. So we've looked at our human system. We now need to look at the fact that. We've got lots of other species as well. That's called biodiversity, lots and lots of species in one area. And we classify them differently. And we've used the Linnaean method of classification. And when we do that, we have got the different kingdoms and the different domains that you need to know about um, and kingdoms. So plant, animal, fungus. And you can go down and you can see how closely related people are by how many names they share. So, for example, Homo sapiens, which is humans, must be closely related to Homo erectus because we both share the name Homo. But then we can go up and we've got the Pan. And Pan refers to the um, great ape family. So we know we're related to great apes and so on. And then we're vertebra, uh, so we're vertebrates, animals with backbones. And so we know we're related also to, say, dogs, canis, rats, um, which are redenta, and then ratus ratus, which actually is the um, genus and species of the common rat. Um, or you could go down and you could say, look at panthera, which is the giant cats, and see how they're slightly different to um, felis, which is the smaller cats. 
so yeah as I say lots and lots of ways to see how everything's interlinked with classification make sure you know it uh, selective breeding I'm not going to go on a rant about this about how humans have destroyed species especially dogs and taken them from working healthy animals to ones with genetic illnesses and can't breathe and oh it's disgusting so i mean we're now trying to mix up breeds and sort it out but it's really awful what humans have done to dogs but not just dogs to cows who get mastitis if you don't um, milk them regularly and are in pain and can die and it's but what we've done is we've taken an animal or a plant that does something and bred it with another plant or animal that does the same thing obviously the plant with the plant and the animal with the animal we're not being weird here um and so you get something that's even better if you want to have a dog with a squashed face because you're horrible you take two dogs with super squashed face and breed them and then their children with even more squashier faces you breed them as well and so on until you have dogs that can't breathe as i say humans are just evil sometimes so that's selective breeding you pick the characteristic you want whether it's long wool on sheep or whether it's lots of meat to eat on your pig or whatever and you breed that um or you can genetically modify and i did this a couple of decades ago you would have a virus that took up a plasmid and then injected it into the next batch of cells so your new cells have a plasmid that can do something like for example make you glow under uv light which is what i used to do so we then have glow in the dark cells yay um, but we usually do it in things like tomatoes to make them last longer. There have been disreputable studies, which means they lied, basically, that newspaper headlines have taken up to say GMOs are going to kill us all and take over the world. There was a lovely film in the 1980s, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Again, if you like your B-movies, it's well worth a watch. Um, but that was out of the fear that these genetically modified organisms or Frankenstein foods were going to be out of control of the scientists and kill us all somehow. Um, it's like Jurassic Park, but with killer tomatoes and so much better or worse, depending on if you like being movies or not. So we're coming to the end. Adaptations and variety, we get this from our sexual reproduction. Why are they any use? Let's look at questions one, six and one, seven. Okay, so let's take a look at those. Here we go with some lovely snails. And you can see um, they're all different. What do they all have if they're all different? Write down the answer. You can pause the video and write it down. Go on, do it. So my scientific term that's describing these differences is, of course, variation. Now, snail pea, which is this lovely little beastie here, is very different to the other five snails. Why might there be an increasing number of snails similar to pea in each future generation? Well, what have we said it's all about? We've said it's all about our variety and our sexual reproduction. So our answer needs to be that snail pea is going to have lots of offspring. It's going to breed. Why might it breed? Lots of reasons. Its, snail, its shell might be thicker. It might be bigger. It might be better camouflaged. It might be able to eat a different type of food to the others and so have more food available. Loads of different answers, so long as it's sensible. Okay? Don't just say snail pea because it looks the best or whatever it's got to be something sensible so you might want to say um it can eat more food or it can survive the winters better or whatever the mark scheme if you've not written it down pause the video and do it the mark scheme gives two potential ones that it's stronger or larger or it's got a bigger shell so it can survive and breed it can pass on its genes or you might say better camouflaged, so it's less likely to be eaten and will breed more. But as I say, 
if you go along the lines of it might be able to it's bigger because it can eat a different type of food and so there's more food available to it so it's going to be able to breed more and the others will die out because there's not enough food that's not necessarily going to be wrong but again it's all about breeding make sure it's about breeding so we've got all this variety but we also need to look at evolution what makes one thing be able to breed and pass on its genes and the other one die out weak and sickly okay because the strong survive that's the whole point survival of the fittest so why are we all different why do we have a species of foxes with different ears why do we have humans and apes and why do we have birds that's a great question isn't it are they government drones or do they actually exist so, sorry. Um, so yeah, why do we have all these different species when we've got one planet? It's because there's loads of different ecological niches and they need to survive in that niche. And what makes a niche? Well, there are two different factors you need to know about lots of these binaries. Biotic and abiotic. Biotic from bios. Same as we get biology. It's about living stuff. So um biotic factors are alive and that could be the plant life you know what you're going to eat or what you're going to compete with if you're another plant it could be what other animals are around are they going to eat you are you going to eat them are they competing for your food and also members of the same species if you are smaller or weaker are you more or less likely to get a mate if you are pink are you more likely to get a mate to something that's green if you're green, you can be camouflaged on leaves. Maybe you'll survive for longer. All of these different factors. Um, and there's also abiotic factors. And these are the not living factors. Things like the temperature. Things like, are you in a desert? Or are you in a, uh, are you somewhere where it rains all the time? You know, what sort of climate are you like? If you're in a desert, you're going to want small ears. If you're in somewhere colder, you're going to want thick fur. Um, you also need to know about the water cycle and the carbon cycle. Um, water cycle, the water goes up, either evaporation or transpiration through the trees, condenses in the clouds, that's condensation, and then precipitation. Down comes the rain and washes the spider out. Um, carbon cycle. If you ask a question on this, just remember the plants take in the carbon dioxide in the air through photosynthesis, but give it out through respiration. Animals that eat the plants are taking in the carbon, but then they die and they can rot and eventually form coal that we're burning carbon dioxide back into the environment. Animals respire as well to get carbon dioxide back out, burning the coal lots and lots of extra co2 we'll cover that more in the chemistry 2 paper because that's where it comes in but you do need to know the carbon cycle um biodiversity i've also said about it's about lots of different living things all in the same area so in the room i'm in right now there are only humans we are the only living things if i were to move five meters to my left and a few meters down because i've fallen out the window i would be in my garden with lots and lots and lots of lovely life forms around me whether that's insects or spiders or worms or birds or just different plants as well lots of plants as well um, the more biodiversity you have the more likely something is to survive and if one piece of life can survive then it can adapt and change again whereas if something killed off all the humans there would be no life in this room but there would still be life in the garden. And the last question we're going to do, you'll be pleased to know, is questions seven, two and seven, three, which is slightly about the carbon cycle, slightly about trees and stuff like that. Let's take a look. So let's take a look at it. Here we go. The lungs of the planet. Forests have been called the lungs of the planet. Why is it correct? Trees do not have lungs. So why is calling forests the lungs of the planet incorrect? Really, really nice for question seven. Pause the video and have a go.
Right, let's look at the answers. So why is it correct? Well, because it's about gas exchange. Forests involve gas exchange with the atmosphere, just like our lungs do. So why is it wrong? Well, forests do it the other way around, don't they? They take in carbon dioxide and they release oxygen, whereas lungs take in oxygen and release carbon dioxide. Um, make sure you do spell answers out for your examiners like this. You do have enough time to write it. Make sure you're spelling out all these answers, because if you don't write it down, the examiner doesn't know that you know it. OK, I will be back soon for C2 and P2. Best of luck to you all. Happy revising and enjoy doing the past paper. Links in the description, remember. OK, take care. Bye.